Hello, this is Erica Del Signore. I'm the founder of Daily Lead Campaign, where we get you lots of leads through social media, video marketing, and now even getting you on TV. And what you're watching today is my um, interview series called Great Minds, Great Marketing. I am really excited about today's guest. This is the third guest of the day, but um, you know, really, really cool and interesting stories coming from Mr. Vance Morris. He is going to be talking to us today about his business and um, you know his past working for Disney and how he's really able to help companies um, bring that magic of Disney into their business and their customer services uh, department so that they can grow. And uh, hopefully I said all that correctly, Vance. Welcome to the show. Did a good job. Thank you, Erica. I appreciate it. You are welcome. So I, I want to get started with you know, the very interesting story of your past because, you know, meeting you, I, I've met you several times over the last few years, and you come across as a very straight-laced and serious guy. I hope that that's not insulting in any way because I know that that's not how you are, but you're very professional, and, uh, you know, I'm a little bubbly and... Uh, uh, yeah, so in any case, it's, it's a contrast when we meet. That's but all right. But you have a whole past, and uh, I'd love for you to tell us about um, your past in my neck of the woods, and you were in a band, and uh, you know how you got to Disney originally, and just give us a, a synopsis of, of how you got started with all this. Sure. Well, um, actually, we can talk about working at a birth control factory another time. That's probably not a story for today, um, but that is one of... <laughs> One of my uh, uh, former jobs. Uh, <laughs> if, if you ever wanted you to start, always start with that. that would break the ice. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we we invented a, a game. Uh, you know, those. Uh, have you ever played Ultimate Frisbee? Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay, I well, we, we we invented a game called Ultimate Diaphragm. Um, <laughs> not exactly. I love it. Not exactly what you want to hear from the Disney guy, um, but you know, back in the '80s, um, I did play in a uh, in a rock and roll band. Uh, it helped pay for college, which was great. Uh, played up in your neck of the woods in Boston and uh, Western Massachusetts quite a bit down in Hartford. Um, great way to uh, to uh, not have to work at a restaurant or something like that to uh, make ends meet. We you know got got a chance to you know have some fun, make some music, and uh, make some money at the same time. So we really enjoyed it. I guess the way I made That's it down awesome. to. And you paid for college. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, I, I made it to Disney a roundabout way. One of um, uh, my old classmates at college uh, had become a recruiter down at Disney in the uh, in the eighties, and um, you know I was looking for a change of scenery. Uh, you know I was young. I was in my early twenties. Uh, you know I heard Central Florida is a great place to be. Uh, a lot of beaches, a lot of babes, a lot of a lot of things going on, so what the heck? Let's uh, let's try things out. So I gave him a call and uh, was able to get a job uh, opening up the Yacht and Beach Club, uh, which is actually very reminiscent of a uh, New England beach town. And um, was on the opening team of the Yacht and Beach Club, where we uh, uh, really it was actually during the uh, first Gulf War, um, and it was really difficult for uh, for Disney to uh, to do anything. Uh, you know, the United States hadn't been at war in God knows how long, um, and so people were really nervous. Our, our um, you know, uh, uh, reservation numbers and uh, occupancy percentages were, were really low, you know, 20s and 30 percent. Um, so, you know, they, they had hired a ton of people, and it was a really uh, difficult time for the company. Um, and that's really how I, how I got down there. I, I, you know, waited tables and bartended for quite a bit um, and then slowly worked my way up the, uh, the ranks. Um, actually, it didn't take quite that long. Uh, within a year, I was a supervisor uh, working at the Yacht and Beach Club and then went and worked with um, Mickey Mouse at a, at a ship called the Empress Lily. Uh, it's no longer there, um, but it was attached to Pleasure Island back in the 90s. And uh, got my first taste of working with my uh, with my boss Mickey, which was uh, very cool. And um, then I was at uh, a place called Pleasure Island. Uh, I was a nightclub manager and duty manager um, at a uh, it was seven nightclubs on uh, on five or six acres. Uh, Disney's failed attempt at uh, nighttime uh, um, extravaganza, combining booze and rock and roll and debauchery and all that fun stuff. 
um, spent some time doing that. Actually, I've, I've had more New Year's Eves than anybody should have. Uh, that was the theme of Pleasure Island was, uh, was New Year's Eve. So I think I had about 14 or 1500 of those things uh, in there. And uh, yeah, no, no, I don't even go out anymore. I don't want anything to do with New Year's Eve. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. I didn't realize it every day. <laughs> every single day was New Year's Eve. Um, well, and, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, after I got tired of that, uh, which, you know, you, you know, working until 2 a.m., getting home at 3 or 4 in the morning, uh, you know, kind of wears on you after a while. So I went and was on the revitalization team of the Contemporary Resort. Uh, we worked at a little restaurant um, that uh, earlier in the year, uh, Chef Mickey's was originally at the at the Disney Village uh, marketplace, and they closed it down for renovations. And so we snagged up uh, Chef Mickey, and we opened up uh, Mickey Mouse's new home at the Contemporary. And I was on the design and opening team of that restaurant, um, and uh, managed it for about four years, uh, which was which was really exciting. So I had a great time with that. Wow, that's fantastic. I just wanted to say that I, I realized that at the beginning of this uh, the story you talked about moving down to Florida, I've heard this before, bikinis is what you left out, babes, and yep. food beaches. Uh, I think that after the diaphragm story that it was okay to say that. Okay, great. <laughs> <Just wanted to. laughs> uh, well, that's, that's a fantastic start. Now, how you got into Disney is interesting. But the things that you've learned and how you've internalized it um, has been, you know, amazing. One of the stories that really stood out, uh, while well, you, you just spoke at GKIC, um, I've, I've been, um, I, I listened to interviews from you before. Uh, you were on the Diamond Call recently, and I listened to that interview over and over again. Um, you know, really, I don't, I don't know if you mind telling that story about the, uh, the silver fork on the floor. Um, oh. I found that one. Quite memorable. Yeah, the you know I, I really can't go out to eat um, at restaurants anymore. Um, I just I, I pick apart the service. I'm I'm not an enjoyable person in a restaurant. There's only, there are very few restaurants that I can go to uh, that I can actually really enjoy myself and that my wife doesn't uh, uh, you know she enjoys herself too if I can uh, uh, keep keep myself in check. Um, but yeah, we were at a pretty high end restaurant. And uh, it was pr probably the bill was going to be, you know, two, three hundred dollars. And uh, there was a fork um, on the floor in the, in the, on the carpet in front of our table. And, you know, it was a navy blue carpet and a bright silver fork uh, illuminated by the lights overhead. Uh, it was just a beacon for me. I, I was just fixated on this on this stinking fork. And the servers would just continually walk over the fork without picking it up, um, which was driving me nuts. What drove me even more bonkers was the fact that the manager stepped over the fork uh, without picking it up. And I mean, we're a pretty high-end restaurant. You'd think that, you know, keeping the place clean and safe would be, uh, uh, you know, one of their top priorities. But uh, obviously, uh, looking down or, you know, keeping in, in, in tune with their surroundings uh, was not something that was uh, taught or uh, maybe it's not my job because um, I didn't see a busboy walk by. So maybe they were expecting the busboy to pick up the fork. Uh, but it was, it was, I was apoplectic, and my wife finally just said, you know, go pick up the fork uh, so we can enjoy dinner. And I did. I went and picked up the fork and, uh, you know, took it over to, uh, to the bus station. And, uh, you know, we sat down and had dinner. And it was pretty uneventful from there. But I was just, uh, you know, it's, it's what are the forks in your business? Uh, you know, you, you, you have to have that attention to detail. And, you know, businesses that lack that or that, you know, continually think, uh, you know, oh, somebody else will do it or somebody else will take care of it. Um, you know, really, they, they, they don't have a, an understanding of the details that are in their business. And, uh, you know, what is that fork saying uh, about the rest of the restaurant? Uh, you know, what are, what are the bathrooms going to be like? You know, what is the kitchen like? Is the food outdated? Uh, you know, is my server going to be, you know, smarmy and, and not pay attention to the finer details of, of service. Uh, so, you know, that one fork says a lot. Um, and, and in the Disney world, uh, they have, you know, something that's called everything speaks. 
Um, and so everything you do, everything in your in your uh, business, uh, in your storefront, whatever, uh, everything will speak. And you know, do you really want to have a fork uh, sitting on the floor speaking for your business? You know, I, I, I have to say, like, you've said so many intelligent things on the stage, and you know, that was the one that disturbed me the most, because I was looking at my own business, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, is, is this the Disney experience? And, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, there, there are things that everyone uh, does well, and there are definitely lots of places for improvement. So I have to tell you, before I started this uh this interview today, I made sure that all my ducks were in a row, that I could get you on and going within a few right. minutes. I'm juggling three live softwares, and sometimes it takes me a minute to set it up, sure. and there are little glitches. I was like, oh, yes, I got them on. Not that you would have complained, but I think you would have noticed. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> but it is. It is all, no, I, you know, attention to the details. Fantastic. It is. It's all about paying attention I did what to you details. So. Yeah, and you know what? I did what you said, um, and I know that everyone preaches this at, at GKC, was to go to the parks and look around. And, you know, one of your businesses, you know you have a couple of businesses, is where you, you literally take people on, tour, you have a seminar where you take people on tours of the park and you show them, you know, what to notice and what not to notice. And that there's... And, a lot of great stories about that. I compared Disney with SeaWorld, so I did a few hours at each one, and you know there were there were only a couple of things that I liked that SeaWorld was doing that Disney wasn't. Um, one of them was the food lines; they had a lot more uh, interesting foods and small carts okay. around SeaWorld where they didn't they didn't really have those kinds of options at Disney. You had to go for the big experience when some people are just studying the marketing and want to get in and get out. Um, right. But uh, yeah, there were there were a lot of amazing things at Disney. Um, you know, they just show you the same product over and over again, the, the best sellers. And uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about this, but I would love for you uh, to give us some examples of uh, some of the things that Disney does. Um, you know, I, I know that you said one of the great quotes from your speech was, uh, "Find the magic in the mundane," and uh, you. You really know how Disney does that best, so it would be awesome if you could uh, show, uh, share a few examples of that. Sure. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that, you know, Disney does so well is, you know, making an experience at Uh-oh. You are paused. Right. I'm lost. Oh, you, oh, you're back. You're back. back. Okay. Okay, so you were just getting down to some of those details. That hasn't happened yet where someone's blacked out for a minute. Uh oh I guess the information is good that that's the, uh, that's the effect. <laughs> okay. So we, we were talking about creating an experience out of the mundane. Is that where we left off? Yes, where I made you disappear. Okay, great. Thank you. Good job. You've created magic. That's uh, great. It's <laughs> but, but, you know, Disney does uh, take uh, e extreme measures uh, to create an experience out of the mundane. One of the things that you have to do at Disney is wait in line. Um, and we all, D Disney's lines are legendary. And they have taken that to uh, to an entertainment factor. They want to make sure that Everything that's done um, at Disney while you're waiting um, gives you uh, an opportunity to uh, enjoy the, enjoy yourself. And the, the lines at Disney are notorious. So they've done a number of things to help alleviate the feeling of, you know, just waiting in a line. You know, they've added entertainment. Um, uh, they call it line entertainment. So they have characters and people, uh, it, you know, entertaining you in line. If you've been to the Haunted Mansion um, at Disney, uh, you'll notice that, you know, there's all sorts of different things for people to interact with. There's, you know, tombstones to play with, uh, you know, inscriptions to read. There's the big giant organ that uh, kids can play with. There's things that are shooting water out. Um, you know, all sorts of different things uh, to occupy your time while you're uh, you know, waiting in line to get into the Haunted Mansion. So waiting in line is part of the experience. And if 
you know, the, some people take on uh, the, the, uh, the, the special guides, the tour guides um, that bypass the line. And I really think that if you bypass a lot of the lines, you're missing out on, you know, the experience of the entertainment that's, that's there. And just getting on the ride, you're almost missing some. It's like, you know, watch it coming in on a movie uh, 10 minutes after it started. Uh, you know, you're kind of like not sure about what the theme is. Uh, sure, you know it's a haunted house, but, you know, you're missing a lot of the backstory. Uh, so, you know, Disney does that uh, very well. Uh, one of the things we did at Chef Mickey's, uh, we also had lines there, so we did have uh, line entertainment. We had people that would, uh, you know, go out there and do caricatures um, in line while people were waiting. Um, you know, really just took whatever we could um, to make sure that it was a great experience even before they got into the restaurant. That's fantastic, and I think you had a, an incredible story about a tornado or a hurricane, I guess would be the proper one for, for Florida. Uh, and if you don't mind, uh, that was a, a really great example of sure. of the service as well. Yeah, um, well, one of the things that, you know, Disney is also known for is their processes. Um, and they have a process for everything. Uh, you know, how much air to put in the bus tire, uh, how many lines that need to be open to, uh, to get cars into the parking lot. Uh, I mean, there is a process, how to clean a table. There's a process for everything. Um, so when Mother Nature strikes, uh, you know, and it's only, there's only been two hurricanes that have directly hit Disney in the last, you know, since it's opened. Um, and one of them was Hurricane Aaron back in 1995. And I was on the hurricane rideout crew uh, at the Contemporary, and we were the place where all of Fort Wilderness, which is Disney's campground, um, ha literally had to abandon the campground and come sleep in our, uh, in our convention center on the floor. So Disney got their mobilization. Wow. Yeah, I got their mobilization of their, you know, hurricane preparedness plan, uh, and, you know, huge pallets started showing up at the Contemporary with blankets and, and movies and food and water uh, and pillows and all sorts of things. So we made a giant campground out of, you know, out of a 15,000 square foot ballroom, um, and people camped out overnight uh, during the hurricane. It was the safest place for them to be. Uh, you know, you don't want to be in a campground in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, no. Unless you want to go for another kind of ride. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we thought it would be cool. You know, the restaurant was going to be slow. Chef Mickey's was not going to be that busy when we opened up because we, you know, had kind of a captive audience. So I took the uh, characters downstairs uh, to the ballroom, and we had Mickey and Goofy and Minnie and all the characters actually waking up uh, the small children um, that were sleeping on the floor down there. So, you know, how cool would it be, uh, you know, for your lifelong friend, Mickey Mouse, you know, the guy you've watched in the movies and TV for your whole life, come down and actually wake you up uh, in the morning. It was a very cool experience and a great way to start their day, you know, after, you know, what could have been a very scary night for them. Absolutely. I know Maisie would love to wake up to that. I might be freaked out if a, a big mouse came and woke up, <laughs> but um, I know that she would really, she would really love it. Um, I think that's fantastic. I'm just looking at my notes here really quick uh, because, you know, I, oh, you know what also really amazed me, and I think I've heard you say this several times before, but um, just speaking to the attention to detail and, uh, you know, even going from painting the post every day to, to never seeing the trash taken out. I mean, can you, like, talk about a few of those? Sure. Well, again, going back to the everything speaks, um, you know, Disney, uh, there are lots of things Disney does, uh, paying attention to certain details that other companies uh they just don't do it. Uh, you know, there are certain things in the parks that are painted almost every single night. Uh, there's, you know, a horse post in, at the Magic Kingdom uh, that they paint every single night so that, you know, it's fresh and wonderful looking for the next day. I mean, they have it down to a science knowing that, you know, what time and, uh, you know, what's the temperature and the humidity and how long it takes the paint to dry. I mean, they got it down to a science as to what time they're going to paint these posts. Um, and it's really just an attention to detail that they want to make sure um, you know, everything looks like a grand opening every single day. So if you've been to a grand opening of a restaurant or a grand opening of a store, um, you know, we've uh, recently had uh, BJ's Wholesale Warehouse and uh, Harris Teeter, which is a uh, local grocery store. Uh, both of them opened up within a couple of months of each other, and they both had huge grand openings. Um, you know, I mean, the place was sparkling. There was employees everywhere helping out. The 
the shelves were completely stocked and looked great. Um, you know, it was just, it was a festive attitude of balloons and, you know, I mean, it was just a lot of fun, kind of like the opening of Disney every single morning. Well, one of them lost sight of the grand opening feeling. And you go in there now, uh, you know, the shelves are not, while they're stocked, they're not abundant looking. Uh, the employees, you really could care less that you're there. Uh, you know, there's no good morning, no hello. Um, you know, when you're leaving, all they do is punch your ticket to make sure then count the items in your cart and make sure you, you know, you're not stealing anything. Whereas the other business, um, you know, still has that grand opening feeling every single day. The employees, um, you know, are greeting you. The, the produce manager is saying hello to you. Uh, you know, is there something that you, we, we don't have that you want? Um, you know, the cashiers, you know, every cashier aisle, you know, there's never more than two people waiting in line. Otherwise, they're opening up new aisles. Uh, there's always seems to be a bagger at every aisle. Um, the place is still clean. Um, and they still have fresh balloons. Um, and so it's a real difference in how, you know, two stores uh, have really approached um, how they're going to serve the public after the grand opening is over. And, uh, you know, taking the time to really make sure is your business or is your storefront uh, really, you know, grand opening ready every single day. Um, you know, just like Disney does every single day. They have the rope drop and it's the grand opening of the Magic Kingdom or the grand opening of Epcot Center every single day of the week. And that's that you know that is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, there was another thing when you and I were talking about uh, my recent visit to to Disney, which I've only been there a few times, but I was noticing that they had a lot of rides that were experiences, kind of like you said with standing in line. But you know, I I was shopping for um, little uh, Disney dresses for my daughter. It's her birthday today. She's going to be four, Great. and so. You know, yeah, I know. I got her an Elena of Avalor dress, which she's wearing to school today, and uh, oh, she's got a Tinkerbell outfit. She's super excited. She doesn't know about that one yet. She's going to get that tonight. Um, but, yeah, I I was really excited because the dresses there are more beautiful than the ones that you can find anywhere else. You have the knockoffs or, you know, whatever they sell at, uh, at uh, Target or whatever. But... Um, I was really excited about what I got, and then I peeked in this little salon that they had where little girls were going in for a, a princess salon day. Mm -hmm. They were getting their nail hair done, and they were getting dressed up like princesses and you know, glitter and everything else. And I just peeked in, and I saw up on the wall, like, the most exquisite or innately designed uh, princess dresses. And I was like, oh, <laughs> where are these in the store? Apparently, you couldn't get those unless you bought no. that experience. So right. I was bummed about that. And the other one was uh, the Beauty and the Beast interactive storytelling, um, and even their restaurant that they have for Beauty and the Beast. All of this is kind of newer to go with all these new um, you know, versions of the movie coming out. But you know, they they've got castles all over the place in the yeah, Magic Kingdom for all. You know, I even took a picture of just. Rapunzel's um, tower, and there was really nothing going on there, but the detail on the tower was, like, incredible. It's just, yep. just really beautiful. So, I mean, are there more experiences like that that you can you can tell us about and, and uh, tie it in with our business? Um, well, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the way that we designed um, Pleasure Island, um, which was again, you know, Disney's failed attempt at you know combining booze and nighttime entertainment. Um, you know, really, uh, they had the show down completely, um, and that was what they focused on. I mean, each one of the nightclubs was themed out to uh, a different genre. So there was, you know, a grunge club, there was a new age club, there was rock and roll, um, you know, a comedy warehouse, and things like that. Um, each one of them was designed for to be the quintessential uh, rock and roll club or the quintessential comedy club. Uh, so, you know, when you walked into one, you knew exactly uh, what you were walking into. And, and I think a lot of times businesses, um, you know, they just accept what they have as their storefront or as their vehicle or however they're getting around town um, or selling their wares that, um, you know, it's not really... Um, 
a great representation of what they do. Um, and so thinking outside the box, of, you know, how can I have my storefront stand out more um, so that it is the quintessential me, um, you know, that, uh, you know, how can I have my vehicle if I'm a ser service person, you know, uh, plumber, uh, electrician, carpet cleaner, etc. You know, how can I have my vehicle be an extension of you know my personality um, and and uh, you know be again as like I said uh, quintessential me. And you know I, I've done that with my you know I, I don't think we talked about my carpet cleaning biz, but I you know I still own and operate an Oriental rug and carpet cleaning operation. And the vehicles uh, that we use um, you know have. Uh, images on them that are striking, that are going to get your attention, and that are, you know, going to be memorable for people. I mean, there's not too many carpet cleaning trucks out there with pictures of babies on the side and big dogs on the back um, and things like that, uh, you know, which are two of my target demographics. Um, so it was, you know, kind of and my... And dirty runs. <laughs> yeah. And they are the main cause of dirty runs. I love pets, you know. Thank goodness for pets. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and then, you know, at our Oriental, I'm sorry? I said I have no rugs because I have two dogs and a little kid. Ah, very smart. Then then you need to make sure you're keeping that wood floor clean because that's, uh, you know, carpets are your uh, number one air filter you, you have in your home. Not that you, not that we want to go down the carpet cleaning story. Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely true. The cleaners just left today and I was so happy that they were here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, well, that's that's amazing. It, it, it is absolutely true that if you can insert your personality in there and, and really tell people about the experience that they're going to get, um, you know, over over uh, you know, just just being the, the normal carpet cleaning company or, or nightclub or what have you, right. uh, and that's really going to get you a lot more business. Um, there's, there's, there's a question I, I keep that keeps coming up in my mind. You've brought up the Pleasure Island a few times, and Gosh, I wish I, I had been able to go by and experience that because it, it sounded really interesting. I can't imagine how Disney would have done uh, nightclubs. I know you've mentioned that it was a it, it was it was kind of a failure, um, and I, I know you mentioned before a few of the reasons why. But um, if you what why would they like Disney failing at something is probably uh, it's probably a good thing for us to study as well as sure. all the things that they do right. Yeah, I mean, you know, Disney does a lot of things right. I mean, they really, they obviously hit more home runs uh, than they do, uh, you know, strike out. But, uh, you know, Pleasure Island was around for, I think it lasted about 12 years. So, I mean, it was around for quite some time. Um, but it wasn't a very Disney place to be. Um, you know, whoever came up with the idea, I mean, if you think about where uh, the guests have been all day long, uh, they've been in the parks, uh, they're probably malnourished and haven't eaten much, uh, they're probably dehydrated, they're exhausted, they're sunburned, um, and then they're coming to a nightclub where we're going to shove a couple of beers in them. Um, and, you know, let's see what happens. And then, you know, to take the joke even further, uh, we had the place called the Rock and Roller Dome which was a roller skating rink with a live rock and roll band. Um, so let's give them a few drinks uh, to these sunburned, uh, malnourished, uh, dehydrated guests, and let's put some wheels under their feet and see what the heck happens. And, um, you know, it really wasn't thought out that well. We literally had an ambulance, you know, waiting every night because somebody was falling down, breaking an arm, breaking a leg. Um, you know, it was just, it, it, it was not well thought out. Um, you know, think about, you know, going to a nightclub and you have to get carted to get in. And Disney, you know, I mean, Disney had to protect its asset and they were vigilant about carting people. Uh, you know, we had Orange County sheriffs parked in our parking lot right out front. So the first thing you saw when you got to Pleasure Island was the police. Um, not exactly a very welcoming, um, you know, presence. Uh, you're like, what's going on here? The police are here. Um, so, you know, we had our fair share, uh, and we had bouncers, you know, and we had our fair share of, you know, fights and arguments and, you know, celebrities that thought they, you know, uh, were better than everyone. Uh, you know, it really was, you know, at times as fun as it was and as, as much as people enjoyed it, uh, you know, the ones that were uh, under control, uh, there was just enough out of control lunacy that, uh, you know, it really made it a uh, not so exciting, not so Disney type place to be. Wow, so that's really an example of them taking a left turn uh, from their image and uh, you know trying to bring that Disney magic to a, a totally different personality. 
um, that's that's definitely interesting to learn from. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you know, Disney's number one customer service standard is safety. Uh, so you know, safety in their rides, safety in their procedures, safety in how they set up their their emergency services. Uh, you know, safety is the number one thing, and Pleasure Island just completely ignored, uh, you know, the safety aspect that Disney is known for. Yeah, well, it, 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 like you pointed out, it's hard to to bring the safety to a, a place where they're just set up for failure, um, where the people were coming from all day, and, and uh, yeah, they probably would have been better to have uh, big, cushy couches with uh, IVs. Rehydrate <laughs> 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 everybody. <laughs> um, uh, but that's the thing. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I, I just remember an interesting conversation you had with someone, I, I don't remember if it was an interview or if I just overheard you talking about this, but you have at all times like 86 different campaigns running for your business to help you continue to bring in new, new clients and to help you um, keep the relationship going with your customer. Is that right? Yeah, for my carpet cleaning business, I have, uh, at last I dropped two, so I'm down to 84, uh, but I do have uh, 84 different campaigns running uh, for both client attraction and client retention. And it's, it's tough. Now, what kind of, it's, 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 it's tough to keep them all running, or what? Well, it's, you know, you need what to be, I'm sorry? These campaigns that you have. What are some examples of the campaigns that you have going? Sure. I mean, you know, it's everything from uh, newspaper ads to direct mail campaigns uh, to, you know, Facebook posts to uh, getting reviews. Uh, you know, we have a whole system uh, email sequence for getting uh, online reviews from our clients. Uh, you know, there's a complete sequence, reminder sequence of, hey, it's been 12 months uh, since your last cleaning. Uh, you know, it, it, it's time to get the gunk out of your carpet. Um, you know, so there's 84 different, um, you know, either reminder sequences or um, uh, new new client acquisition um, that are running at every different time. And, and I've got a good CRM, uh, you know, but you, you, you do need to go in there and, you know, measure how well each one of those is doing. That's why I dropped two of them. Uh, you know, they just were not performing. Uh, were not worth the money that uh, that I was uh, spending on them. Uh, the ROI was was horrendous. Uh, so I, so obviously you drop them, and you've got to be able to measure your marketing uh, tools uh, that you have going. And if you don't have a, a method of doing that, it's just like flushing money down the toilet. Now, um, what CRM are you using? Are you an Infusionsoft? Um, I have Infusionsoft for one of my businesses, but I have a, a custom uh, uh, site. Uh, that's uh, called uh, Service Monster for uh, that's designed for service uh, businesses. Uh, so it's got you know truck routing software built into it. Um, it's got a pretty good CRM built into it. Um, but um, you know, so that's a. I mean, it's off the shelf. Anybody can get it. Um, I really like it because it integrates you know everything that I need as far as scheduling and you know keeping in contact with clients and measuring the return on um, you know on my uh, marketing campaigns. Now you have so many going, but you are not new at this. So, <laughs> what would your advice be for uh, you know newer entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that just really haven't done anything but word of mouth, which it happens a lot more than you think? Um, right. Where would you say they should get started? Like, what what kind of a marketing combination um, strategy would you put in there? Well, I mean, obviously, it really depends on you know what kind of business it is, uh, you know, where they're where they're getting, whether it's a geographic business or whether it's you know a global business, online uh, retailer or something like that. Um, but you know, certainly, I would be looking at uh, if you're a local type business, um, you know, opportunities to be in things where your competitors are not. So you know, can you get into a Val Pack or a Money Mailer? Um, you know that uh, you know maybe doesn't have I I don't do them uh, only because there's already three or four other carpet cleaners in the Val Pack and in the Money Mailer and I'm not going to be you know I don't want to be you know compared to my competition I want to be able to market to them in a vacuum so you know I rely a, a lot on direct mail and I think direct mail has has its place uh, you know in local geographic companies and being able to really take the time, you know, you can send out a few letters, see how they work, um, you know, if you get a couple uh, coming back, then you can take the money that uh, that you 
that you made from from those jobs, reinvested in some more direct mail. Um, you know, I think definitely having an online presence, um, you know, and garnering reviews, especially for service companies, is extremely important. Um, so if you don't have a method for getting online reviews, I mean, Google ranks you very well if you've got uh, reviews um, on your on your Google site. Um, so I definitely recommend doing that. Google AdWords has been great for me. I don't do it myself. Um, you know, I have somebody managing the Google AdWords. Um, I know enough about it to be dangerous um, and to screw it up royally. Um, I tried it and I was like, eh, never again. Um, so I've got somebody who manages my Google AdWords, somebody who manages my Facebook uh, posting and marketing. Um, so, you know, if you can't afford to have somebody do it for you, um, you know, don't, trying to do it yourself, um, you know, really make sure you know what you're doing because it's real easy to waste a lot of money really fast uh, by, you know, doing trial and error. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's important to try something, go small first, and then, you know, test those ads out. I mean, we, we do that a lot with um, with YouTube and LinkedIn, and uh, it, that's really the best method. Um, so, let me see, there was one last question that I wanted to ask you, and... Um, well, actually, it's it's about your your Disney business and how you're teaching companies about that. I know we're going to be sending people to uh, that training website, and uh, it would be great to hear about how you got into that and and what kind of things you teach and and what exactly do you do with a a tour at Disney. I sure. I have never been on one, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Um, so we take small groups. Uh, you know, I try and keep it to 20 or 25. Um, yeah, I've got a group next year, 40. So I'm not sure how I'm going to corral all these people through Disney World, but uh, um, so a group of about 20, 25 people uh, can be the same uh, business niche. Uh, you know, earlier this year I took down a group of home inspectors, and you know, we started off. Um, we have a big opening reception um, where I invite some of my old friends who are Disney senior executives, senior managers at Disney to come down and, and, and come to the reception. And it's really a chance for you to talk to uh, Disney managers, guys that are doing this uh, day in and day out with, with the, you know, the guest experience, with running the parks or running a restaurant or hotel. And, you know, really just get a chance to ask any question you ever wanted to. I mean, you know, you, you think you've got problems with a 10-person or a 3-person, uh, you know, staff. You know, imagine having, you know, 4,000, 5,000 people reporting to you. Uh, not always the easiest thing uh, to manage. And so they talk about uh, those things. They talk about customer service recovery and how to, uh, you know, overcome, you know, objections and overcome things that might have gone wrong. I mean, sometimes, you know, things go wrong at Disney. And, you know, what do they do for service recovery? Um, the um, uh, the next day uh, we have a uh, we have a great breakfast um, and then we go into the classroom for about four or five hours uh, where I show uh, people the Disney system of customer service and we go through um, you know my program which is called systematic magic uh, you know how to disnify any business and so at the end of this period of time you know people have a outline or a blueprint of you know how to create um, a Disney style service in their own business uh, which is pretty cool and then we go out to Epcot Center and we look at the things that we just learned about and we try and find those things in the parks you know uh, you know how is Disney uh, doing the wow process. Uh, you know, what are some of the details that, uh, that Disney um, is looking at? Uh, what's their customer service theme and their customer service standards? So we try and match up what we just learned in the classroom with uh, what we can see in the park. And we have a huge reception um, at Epcot during the uh, nighttime illumination show. Um, and then the following day, uh, we go through and do a behind the scenes tour um, of the Magic Kingdom. So you get a chance to see. Uh, all that's going on, you know, behind the scenes to make the magic happen, which is really cool. Then we have a wrap-up seminar, um, and uh, we let them uh, we let them run loose, and um, it's really it's it's two and a half days of just uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there is some work um, involved, but uh, it's a lot of fun for for folks. Now, how can they get to this? I mean, do they have to join um, kind of under a person, or do you have them scheduled out uh, to where you can just add people on your own or 
how does it work? Uh, yeah, I typically will take groups. Uh, so, you know, people that have, you know, 8, 9, 10, 20 people that are, you know, uh, that are interested in doing it. Uh, yeah, I am toying with the idea of putting a group together myself, just, you know, onesie twosies, uh, you know, here and there. If you go to the website, uh, you can uh, download uh, um, a free report, which will get you um, on my list, and you'll be able to see when the next, uh, the next Disney trip is coming up. Okay, and I do have the link at the top of this um, at the top of this Facebook Live. So in the description, the link to Nancy's uh, to Nancy's website is there, where you can download that free report. And you know, I think that that's um, that's something that you should do. Just to watch his marketing in action is uh, is a pleasure, I'm sure. I need to get. I'm going to get on the list today. I, I, <laughs> I don't know why I'm not on the list. I, I just joined Dave B's list, and I'm like oh, okay. just like. These emails are incredible and uh, it, you know, interesting to read. So I, yeah, I've, I've got to join the list where the people are just dynamic, like, like people like you and Dave. So um, I, I would suggest that everybody go to Vance's website and and uh, and join up. And so you know, that's fantastic. Now, just before we go, do you have any um, any insights on future trends with Disney? Like, where are things going? Um, even with customer service or business in general, uh, I, I'm not sure what part of the business you want to talk about, but just future trends in general for us to look for. Well, you know, Disney is a huge innovator uh, when it comes to technology. Uh, you know, they're coming up with, uh, you know, they've done some incredible things with drones, and their drones show, I mean, you know, hundreds of drones in the air at the same time. Um, so they're really, you know, they take the technology and then they really exploit it. Um, I think we're going to see a lot with um, uh, artificial intelligence at Disney. I think they're just going to continue to plus uh, their business, uh, which is Walt's word for you know co continuous improvement, plusing. Um, and I, I think we're going to see some really cool stuff with uh, with robots and robotics, um, artificial intelligence, um, and you know anything that's coming down the pike. I, I think we're we're really going to have uh, uh, some really cool effects and some some other ways that uh, that Disney is going to really wow their guests. Um, I, I see a lot of that coming down the pike. Yeah, you can't you can't help but smile when you're at Disney, and uh, yeah. I know a lot of things going on in the background uh, to make that happen, and you don't even notice. And I guess that's the way it's supposed to be, right? That's right. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, um, we're coming up against the clock here. I I, def I want to thank you. I mean, that was just an information-packed interview. I I just want you to know that as you were talking, there were so many other things <clears throat> that I could have asked, and right. because you are such you know, you're an inter interesting person to interview, uh, but I, I don't want to take advantage of you um, <laughs> by keeping you here for hours. Uh, I know I appreciate it, uh, but I hope I, I'm so glad that the audience gets to to hear your knowledge and uh, and hear some of the really cool insights about what goes on behind the doors of Disney and, and how you can actually take and apply that to your own business to to plus your own uh, revenues this year. Right. So um, thank you so. Much for coming, Vance. That was my pleasure, Erica. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. And this is Erica Del Signore interviewing Vance Morris today on my Great Minds, Great Marketing interview series. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. Enjoyed it, and I will see you all next Tuesday where we'll have three more live interviews. <laughs> and you'll see this one on a blog coming out in the next few weeks. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.